After doing a similar video for Shogun 2, I feel the need to do one for Three Kingdoms as well. So today's video, I'll be showing you guys 10 things I wish I knew before playing Total War Three Kingdoms. Starting off at number 1, Building Optimization. I always build the two agricultural buildings, first to maximize my food production and peasantry income, land development and government support. As food is a scarce resource, especially if you do not own any farms in your starting region. Upgrading your town requires tremendous amount of food, even more so when you already have multiple high level cities. When I have plentiful of food income, I make sure to keep it that way. If I were to lose the regions that produces the main sources of food income, my entire nation may collapse in a matter of days. If you are confident you will not lose your food income, you can trade it with your nearby allies or simply change the building to the food selling one instead of food production. The third and fourth building will depend on your immediate need. Choose between either the confusion temples from the government buildings or the military infrastructure from the military buildings. If you have a particularly high negative public order, then go for the confusion temples, as you can always replace it with administration office later on once you have reforms that help towards public order. Military infrastructure, on the other hand, is a must-have for every single town, especially if you play on legendary difficulty. You will most likely be at war on multiple fronts, and in my own playthrough, I have found out that the AIs actually avoid sieging my cities once I have this belt. They will often look for the smaller settlements to attack instead. For the 5th building, or the 4th, if you don't actually need the Confucian Temple, you must build a state workshop that goes towards Grand Treasury Men or the Administration Office that goes towards Office for Archives and Seals to reduce corruption. I will make sure to explain corruption later on. For the final slot, you can really build anything to your liking, especially ones that complement the minor settlements. I also recommend turning one city into a military city where the focus is to recruit better troops. All the military buildings should be built in that particular city as it will increase the starting rank for all recruits and reduce the recruitment costs. Number 2. Idle Characters At the start of each campaign, you may notice that your income is rather low. One simple way to improve this is to head over to the core tab and select any characters that is not currently in use and click release from service. This way, you can free up a lot of upkeep, and depending on your starting faction, the decrease in upkeep can vary from a few hundred to around a thousand, which is massive especially in the early game. Even in the later stages of the game, there will be random characters being hired that may not be necessarily useful in any way. And it would be best to get rid of them to reduce the upkeep cost. However, keep in mind that it may be worth it to keep certain legendary characters, as their combat capabilities are worth far more than the current upkeep. Number 3. Corruption If you have no prior knowledge to this, please put a halt to your campaign right away, as this is something that will come back and haunt you later on. To check corruption, click on any city and hover your mouse to the bottom left of the screen on top of the current income, and here you will see corruption. It may seem insignificant at the beginning, but the further you play, the more cities you have, the higher this corruption increases by. And if this corruption rate increases to 100%, you will earn zero from that particular region. To combat this, you would want to have at least either state workshops that builds into Grand Treasury Mint or Administration Office that goes into Office for Archives and Seals for every single city. Not only does this building reduce corruption rate in that one single city, it also reduces corruption in any nearby provinces. If there are multiple other cities nearby, you can quite easily reduce this corruption rate in all the nearby commanderies to zero where it will have no effect on your income. On the off chance that some of your cities are isolated or you do not have many other commanderies surrounding it, it is better to build the administration office, as it offers higher reduction rate in corruption. You only really need one anti-corruption building as long as your cities are not spread too thin. Number 4. Unit Formations There are various of ways to unlock formations. The type of generals that unlock formations are commander and strategist. Whilst the commander needs to be the commanding general, the strategist does not need to be. You can select the commanding general by clicking on the character and select a point commanding general right above the character. At level 2, you will unlock the loose formation for all units, including militia units. But to enable advanced formations, which the militia units cannot use, you need to have level 4 commander leading the army or a level 4 strategist within the army. 
With this, you will unlock all the unit formations you need. There are also certain followers that grant you one particular unit formation when equipped by a general, but they come at random and are hard to come by, so I wouldn't count on it. Number 5. Army Stance If you select any of your own army on the campaign map, hover on the icon above the commander or general, you will see a total of 4 army stances you can choose from. With the march stance, you gain a 50% increase in movement range, but the downside is that you will not be able to initiate a battle, recruit, or replenish troops, and if entered into battle, all units will start off being tired instead of fresh. This is particularly good if you want to hurriedly escape enemy territory or to reinforce another part of your kingdom that requires immediate defense. The Encampment Stance This army stance will help you solidify your current position without being inside a settlement, giving you a temporary fortification, extra military supplies, and an easier time against enemy troops overall. However, it will require you to have 50% movement range to enable this stance, and you will be rendered immobile. So be careful where you encamp, as you definitely don't want to be a sitting duck for multiple stacks of enemies to attack you at once. The Ambush Stance I personally dislike Ambush Stance because of all the extra micromanagement you will have to do. The starting position going into the enemy army, even though it is favorable, I have not really tested it out myself when all I want to do is relax and watch a battle unfold. So make sure to let me know how it goes if you were to try out the Ambush Stance. Number 6. Bait the encampment stance is a very strong army stance that you can use to bait enemies into attacking you, giving you a more favorable engagement, as you will build a fortification using this, meaning the enemies have to fight through archer towers and 4 tight choke points which you can funnel all your troops into. Stack them up and combine it with the archer towers, you are then able to defeat against armies many times bigger. It will also grant all your units slight morale bonus if you keep the center of the encampment under control. However, the problem is that this may not be as effective past the early game as the AI armies will have unlocked fire arrows that can destroy and burn down your temporary fortification, which would be worse than if you just done an open battle, because what you thought was 4 choke points you have to hold turns out to be 4 sides of wide open field you have to worry about once the fortification burns down. Number 7. Army Composition Generally. I would like to keep the starting unit as removing them and recruiting new units would take too long and delay your advancements in the first few turns of your campaign. Militia units are pretty solid overall, it is something I go for in any army during the early stages of any campaign. Something like 6 gym militia with a champion, 6 archer militia with strategist or commander, and 3 sword militia plus 3 militia lancer cavalry with either a sentinel or a vanguard as it is a pretty decent combo. But as you progress further, even with the militia units being level 10, they will not last you the entire campaign, because they simply get outclassed by other units that have better default stats. Previously, level 10 militia units could and would last you the entire campaign, giving you no reason to upgrade your troops to anything. But there has been an update since then that made militia unit at level 10 weaker than it was. Now moving into the mid game, you should look into recruiting spear guards or heavy spear guards and jin sword guards as your primary frontline infantry units. As I had mentioned previously, with the unlock of unit formation, you can get away with a lot using these units, and only slightly more expensive than militia units while having a lot higher value due to having the battle formations. For this army setup, spear guards and jin sword guards are interchangeable. Pick whichever one suits your general. If you have a champion, pick spear guards. If you have a sentinel general, pick jin sword guards. I would then have 6 militia lancer cavalry, mainly due to their high movement speed. Combined with 6 archer units, you can choose from either archer militia or the medium archers, depending on your income, as they are both fairly decent units. Transitioning to the late game, you can actually keep the spear guards and jin sword guards as your frontline. They actually hold up pretty well even against some of the elite units that you can go toe to toe against if your units are level 10. For the cavalry units, you definitely want to upgrade them to either the cataphracts or heavy cataphracts, as the militia lancer cavalry simply does not have the same impact on the enemy elite units in comparison with the cataphracts anymore. For the bow units, you want to eventually recruit the onyx dragons as they are the ranged units that has the highest DPS available to all hand factions, even against armored opponents oftentimes out-damaging crossbow units. 
for the ultra late game when you have become an emperor, it is no brainer what units you should go for. All the imperial units are strong and cost effective, the only downside is the low replenishment rate, so keep that in mind. Number 8, Group Attack Similar to my Shogun 2 video, I'm going to repeat this here as well. This method allows your units to attack individual enemies without having you to click on each and every single unit manually. You first want to make sure to select all the units that you want to attack with, press Ctrl G to lock them into the same group. Next, all you have to do is right click the enemy center so your units will path correctly. Then once they get close enough, they will automatically charge to the nearest enemy. In a large scale battle, this will be extremely useful and save you a lot of hassle from micromanaging. Now you can sit back, relax, and enjoy the battle unfold. Number 9, Siege Defense. Oftentimes when you are forced to fight a siege defense, it is mainly due to the enemies heavily outnumbering you. But don't worry, what you should do first is scout the enemies and see where they will be coming from. Next, try to find the most suitable choke point to hold. Initially, you want to have cheap unit at the choke point to tank the enemy missile fire. Then once they close in, you can then stack at least two melee units on top of each other. Now, I don't have any sufficient evidence, but I personally have found this the most effective way to play my siege battles, especially in legendary difficulty. It is much better to stack them together to increase the DPS output and also even out the damage you take between the two units, thus preserving the morale. Try to choose the choke point with friendly terrorists guarding it. This will further increase the damage per second you will do to the enemies. However, you may not always be able to count on the Archer Terrors because some enemy AIs will have fire arrows ready to destroy them. Stacking your units on top of each other will also help prevent the enemies from pushing in to capture the Terrors whilst you are still defending it. Lastly, if you have any cavalry units, do not be afraid to sally forth with those cavalry units. Look for the weakest part of the enemy army and strike there. Prioritize missile units always, then look to get a clean charge off into infantry units making them run around in circles so they have no time to brace for a charge. Using these methods, it will help you defend much more efficiently and may even win you some battles that you thought weren't possible. Number 10, Diplomacy. This is a tip that can be applied for any faction. If you call for a peace treaty against a hostile faction, they may not always accept it at first. But what happens is, after you win multiple major battles, you have an increase in diplomacy bonus against whatever faction you just won the battles against. So, if you have multiple enemies to deal with, you can call for a peace treaty after winning the battles. Ending a war so that you can focus on dealing with less enemies at a time. This is particularly useful if you are starting with the yellow turban factions, as they are thrown into the center, and everyone will declare war on you straight at the beginning. With this method, you can slow down the game, and give yourself a chance to breathe and plan your next move without being overwhelmed. So that's it for 10 things I wish I knew before playing Total War 3 Kingdoms. Let me know what you think of these tips, and comment down below which of these tips you found the most useful. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe if you enjoyed my content, and as always, thank you guys for watching, I'll see you guys next time, goodbye.